Hello everyone and welcome back to the course. In this lesson, we will learn how to apply smooth movement to our blueprints by using interpolation. We will take a look at three common methods of applying interpolation and build a simple example to see the differences. Let's get started. Before we jump into Unreal, Let's take a moment to understand the underlying methods we will use to apply movement. So what is interpolation? Interpolation is a method of constructing or finding new data points based on the range of a discrete set of known data points. In other words, by using interpolation, we can take two values, say a starting and an ending value, and estimate other values in between for a smooth transition from one value to another. Interpolation can be used for many purposes. As long as you want to smoothly transition from one value to another, you can use interpolation. In this lesson, we will focus on using it specifically for movement. But keep in mind that the principles we learned today can also be applied to many other use cases. Now let's jump into Unreal and see how it's done. And now that we're back in Unreal, let's think about how we can show smooth movement. Instead of using our generic actor with a light, let's go ahead and create a different actor to show movement. And in my opinion, one of the easiest ways to do it is by creating a platform. So let's go ahead and right click on the content browser, click on Blueprint Class, and we're going to create another actor class. So click the button and name this BP platform. Double click to open it. Let's expand it. And in this case, let's simply add a cube that will serve as the platform itself. Select it. And now with the cube selected, let's scale it to 2, 2.1. If we zoom out, we can see that we have a simple platform. Go ahead and compile. And let's go back to the level and simply drag our new platform to our level. We'll place it right there. So our goal is to move this platform from its current location to a target location. So the first thing we can do, let's go back, is to create a vector location that will be the target location. So we can create a new variable and let's call this end location. Let's make this of type vector. And in this case, let's click on show 3D widget on the details panel. And actually before doing that, we need to make it instance editable. And then we can show the 3D widget. Go ahead and compile. And if we go back to our map, we can see that now we have a physical widget. And we're gonna zoom in here that represents the actual end location. So you can actually select it by clicking it and move it. And you can see that now we have an actual widget in our level that represents our end location. Let's put it a little bit higher. And now let's go back to our blueprint. Let's go back to the event graph. And for this first example, we'll use a node called interp2 or interpolate to. So right click and search for inter. And you'll see that under interpolation, we have many different nodes. The important ones are called interp to, and you can see that we have even different kinds like rotators, vectors, and the most common one, the float, F interp to. In this case, let's select the vector interp2. And this node will take a current vector, a target vector, and will return the interpolated vector right here as the return value. So an easy way of doing this is simply grabbing a reference to our cube or platform. So select it, drag it to the event graph. And in this case, we want to set its relative location from where it is right now to our end location. So simply drag 
and search for set relative location. Go ahead and select it. And we're going to connect this to event tick. And the new location will be the result of the interpolation. So go ahead and connect it. And now we know that the target location will be our end location. So go ahead and drag it and connect it directly. And the current location can be simply grabbed by grabbing a reference to the cube, dragging and searching for relative location. We're going to get it, get relative location, and we're going to connect it to current like so. The next value we need is the delta time. The delta time, as the tooltip says, is the time that has passed since the last tick. It's basically the time between frames in your game. And you notice that event tick already provides the delta seconds as a float. So we can either connect it directly like this, or we can have a separate node that will basically return the same value here. So right click and search for world delta seconds. Then go ahead and select it. And we can connect this node to delta time. And finally, we need to add an interpolation speed. In this case, let's just add one. Let's go ahead and compile. And now on every tick, we're going to grab the cube's location and we're going to set it to a new location. And that new location will simply be the interpolated value between its current relative location and the end location. And we're gonna use this speed and every tick will set the location this way. Let's go back to our map. And now if we press simulate, so click on the three dots here, click on simulate, and notice how our platform now moves from its initial location all the way to its end location. Go ahead and stop. Notice that this can be movement to any location. It's not just a vertical movement. If we grab our end location, we can change this and move it to wherever we want. Whoops. And if we press simulate, the platform simply moves to our end location. Let's go ahead and stop and go back to our platform. This is one of the simplest ways to smoothly move an actor or a blueprint within our level. Notice that this form of interpolation grabs the current value and a target value. Typically, the target value is a fixed location but the current value in this case is typically a moving value. So in this case, the relative location continues to change as we're changing it here, but the target in this case, the end location remains the same. For the most part, you're going to be using this node with tick or perhaps a timer because this node needs to be constantly called to get the updated values. Before moving to the next example, I wanted to show you a different type of interpolation node. So if we go ahead and right click and search for V interp2, you'll see that we have V interp2, which is the one we just used. And there's a different version that says constant. Go ahead and select it. And you can see that the nodes are virtually the same the difference is that the regular interpolation node, as you can see on the tooltip, tries to give a smooth feeling when tracking a position. In other words, it has a little bit of easing. In contrast, the constant node tries to reach a target at a constant rate. There is no easing when it comes to the interpolated value. So same results, one node has easing and another one has no easing. And this will be the case for nodes for vectors, for floats, and for rotators. There will be two different versions of the same node. For this next example, we use another node that does linear interpolation, or LERP for short. So if we go ahead and right click and search for LERP, you can see that we have several different options here, just like before. 
we have linear interpolation for color, for floats, rotators, transforms, and vectors. Go ahead and select LERP for vector. And as you can see, this node is very similar to the interpolate node. It takes two vectors, A and B, and interpolates between A and B by using an alpha. An alpha in this case is a range between zero and one, or zero and 100%. And if you look at the tooltip, it basically tells you when this value is zero, the return value will basically be A. And when this value is one or 100%, the return value will be B. So as we're smoothly increasing the alpha from zero to one, the interpolated vector will go smoothly from A to B. Unlike the V interp to node, both of these values needs to be static or fixed. So we already have a B, which will be our target. And we can just go ahead and copy the end location. But now, instead of having a current relative location that will change, we need to have a static location or a starting location. And we can do that by simply saving the cube's location, our platform location, on begin play. So if we scroll up, let's create a new vector variable and let's call it starting location. Let's make this a vector and let's drag it to our event graph. Select set starting location. And now we're simply going to save our relative location on being play. So go ahead and copy and simply connect. So you can see we have a starting location that will be saved on begin play. And now we can add our starting location to A like so. So let's go ahead and move these nodes out and replace them with the LERP node. And now we need to have an alpha value that we're going to increase smoothly. So we can simply right click and promote to variable. And now we have an alpha variable that will hold the actual value. Let's compile and let's move this a little bit back. And now we need to manually increase the alpha value on every tick. So we can copy the alpha node here and we can again set the alpha node to a new value. So go ahead and grab alpha and set. And now we're going to grab the current value of alpha and add another value and then simply set it to alpha. And go ahead and connect. And because this is going on every tick and you're most likely running your game at 120 frames or ticks per second. We want to make sure that the value is very small here so we actually have a chance to see the platform smoothly move to its location. So go ahead and enter 0.01 and let's go ahead and compile. Now on every tick we're going to lerp between the starting location to its end location. Then we're going to increase the alpha by 0.01 and it'll continue to increase indefinitely until it gets to, well, one in this case. But we're gonna see something curious uh, once we run our game. So let's go back to our map. And now you see the location here. Let's go ahead and click simulate and see what happens. As you can see, the platform reached its end location, but it continued indefinitely to a different location. And that is because our alpha can go above one. So in this case, the node is continuing to interpolate past the one value of the alpha. So what we can do is simply limit our alpha to one. And the easiest way to do that is to use a clamp. So let's go ahead and move this here and drag from here and search for clamp. And we are going to use the clamp float option that we see here. Go ahead and select it and connect the return value to our alpha. Clamping basically means that we're going to return a value between a minimum and a maximum. And if a value is below the minimum, we will return the minimum. And if a value is above the max, we will return the max. So in this case, you can add any values you want, but we actually want zero to one because our alpha should be zero to one. So now if we go ahead and compile, go back to our map, 
and click on simulate, you see that now our platform smoothly interpolates to its end location and it stops here because even though we continue to increase our alpha, let's go ahead and stop, our clamp node is returning a maximum of one. Now let's go ahead and make this example a little bit more interesting. What if we wanted the platform to go back and forth between its starting location and its ending location? Well, we already have the code for the platform to go from starting to end. So logically, we could simply copy this code and paste it underneath and simply invert the starting and ending locations here to do the opposite. So let's go ahead and do that. There you go, as you can see now, if we execute this line of code, we will go from the end location to the starting location. And how can we switch between these two pieces of code? Well, we could use a branch, for example. So let's make space for that and drag from event tick and search for a branch. And when the branch is true, we will go from starting to end. And when the branch is false, we will go from end to start. And now we need a condition to switch between these two movement modes. Let's go ahead and create a Boolean. So right click, promote to variable, and let's name our Boolean forward. So this Boolean will tell us if we're going forward, go ahead and execute this piece of code here. And if we're going backwards, go ahead and do the opposite, simply lerp on the opposite direction. So all we need to do is find the condition where we need to make our forward variable false to then execute this line of code. So if we go ahead and compile, we make sure that our default value for forward is true. So we're gonna go ahead and start executing this. And what if we said, if the alpha value reaches one, then we know that we reached our destination and we need to invert. So we can simply say, alpha equals one and if the alpha equals one let's go ahead and drag a branch from here then at this point we know that the forward variable needs to be set to false so drag forward click set forward and connect it to true and in this case we will we will set this to false and we're going to repeat and copy this code but in this case, we want to make forward true. So now we see that we're gonna execute this line of code, and as the alpha continues to increase, this will, see, this will say, hey, is the alpha one? No, nothing happens. Once the alpha hits one, and we know it will eventually, we now switch our Boolean to false, which will now, on the next tick, trigger this line of code here. There's one more thing that we need to do, and it is to reset our alpha. Because notice that our alpha will be 1, so if we don't reset it, once we come here, the platform will immediately jump to the starting location, because the alpha is 1. So all we need to do now is simply reset our alpha, so drag alpha, and click on set, and connect it. And usually when I say reset, we simply go back to its default value, which is 0. And we'll do the same thing at the bottom here. And let's go ahead and compile. And let's look at the final piece of code here. If we go back to our map, click on simulate, you can see that our platform is going back and forth from beginning location to end location, and then from end location to beginning location indefinitely. Let's go ahead and stop go back to our blueprint. For this next example, we'll use a component that actually does everything we've done in this example and more. And that component is called a timeline. So let's go ahead and make some space here. And if we right click, we can search for timeline. And right at the bottom, let's go ahead and click add timeline. And give it a name. In this case, I named it TM underscore movement. And you can see here that we have a lot of different options. We can play, we can play from start, we can stop, 
reverse, and even reverse from end. This node will basically interpolate by using one or more curves and on every, uh, let's call it tick of interpolation, it'll fire the update pin. And then once it's finished interpolating, it'll then fire the finished execution pin. This will allow us to simplify this example below while giving us more control. So go ahead and double click your timeline node and you'll see that now we have a separate window and we can add different tracks. So let's click on the plus track button here and you can see that we have several different options. You can add a float, vector, event and even a color track. For this example, we will just add a flow track and let's call this track alpha. Now you can right click inside the graph and click on add key. And for this one, we will simply add time zero value zero. And let's go ahead and right click again and add another key. And for this one, let's add time one value one. And if you click both of these icons here, it'll basically align the view so you can see all of your points. We're going to adjust the length of our timeline to one second. And now you can see that we are simply interpolating between a value of zero at time zero, as we go through the time here, until it reaches a time of one or one second, and that value will be one. What we've basically done is we are interpolating between the value 0 and 1 in a linear fashion. This will be the exact same thing as doing a linear interpolation with a float value. So if we go ahead and compile, and let's go back to our event graph, notice that now we have an alpha float pin here that would be the exact same thing as we had our alpha here. So now we can just copy these nodes here and connect them to the update pin. But instead of using an alpha value, let's go ahead and remove that. We can just connect our alpha float from our timeline to the alpha pin on our alert. And this is going to do everything that we have done below. So all we need to do is now execute the play pin and it'll go from 0 to 1, as that is our alpha values here, which will then lerp between the starting and the ending location. So the easiest way will be to create a custom event that we can call. So we hit play here. So right click and search for custom event. Go ahead and click it. And let's name this custom event go forward. And let's connect it to play. And now all we need to do is call our go forward custom event to play our timeline. So why don't we call our go forward custom event on begin play here. So drag from starting location and search for go forward. And now all we're doing is calling go forward on begin play, which will simply interpolate from start to finish. So compile. And before we test this out, Let's disconnect our event tick so we don't have both pieces of code running and compile. Go back to our map and click on simulate. So you can see our platform moved between its starting location to its end location. Go ahead and stop. Go back to our blueprint. But obviously we can do a lot more than that. You notice that we have a reverse pin here. So we can now emulate this behavior by simply calling a function called reverse. So let's create another custom event and let's call this go back and we can connect it to reverse. And now all we need to do is simply call go back when our timeline is finished. Let's move this up. Let's compile and see what happens. Click on simulate. And we're done. Let's go ahead and stop and see what is happening here. Once the, the timeline finishes, it'll simply call go back, which will go on reverse. And when the timeline finishes again, 
through the go back, it'll simply call go back again. So if we want to emulate the same behavior that we have here when it goes back and forth, we need to then call on finish either go forward or go back. So same as before, we could use a branch. So let's go ahead and drag from finish and add a branch. But now, instead of using our Boolean, which we could use forward here, notice that we have an enum here called direction. So drag from direction and search for equal equal and select enum equal here. And you'll see that this enum is actually returning whether we're going forwards or backwards in our timeline. Perfectly convenient in our case. So if we are going forward, connected here, we want to call go back. But if this is false, meaning we are going backwards, we actually want to call go forward. And now you can see that on begin play, we are calling go forward, which is playing our timeline. We're lerping from starting to finish. Once this is finished, we are checking whether we were going forward or backwards. And based on that, we are either calling go back, which will reverse, or go forward, which will just play the timeline normally. So if we go ahead and compile, go back to our map, and now if we hit simulate, we see that our platform is going back and forth, just as before. Let's go back. However, this setup is a lot simpler than this setup. So I'm gonna make a little bit more space here. And now you can see all of the code here. However, there's more that we can do with timelines. Yes, we did replicate the same functionality as before, but we can do so much more with them. For example, if we go back to our timeline, notice that this is a curve. We could add more values in the curve here to smooth out our movement. So for example, if you right click on that first dot here, on our first point, go ahead and right click. You can change the key interpolation from linear, which is what we had before, to say user. And you can see that now we have a different kind of curve. And if you select any of those points, you'll have these handles here and you can grab the handles and manipulate the values to change the curve. So that is one thing we can do. Instead of having it linearly interpolate, we can add as many points as we want and change our curve, which will of course change the float value here and the alpha. And we can actually also change the play rate of our timeline. The play rate is basically the speed in which the timeline plays. So because we made our timeline be one second, a play rate of one will basically mean that it will play in one second. So what we could do is we could drag our timeline from our components here, TM movement. So go ahead and select it and drag. Select get TM underscore movement. And from here, drag and search for set play rate. Go ahead and select it and connect it to go forward. Actually, we're going to do this before we call go forward. So let's disconnect this. And the reason for that is because we want to set the play rate before we actually call our timeline. Makes sense. And we know that a play rate of one will simply allow us to play our timeline in one second. So if we right click, promote to variable, we can then use this value called new rate. We'll make this instance editable so we can change it in our level. If we compile it. Let's make our new rate be one and compile again. And nothing will change if we test. Let's go back to our map. And with our platform selected, notice that we have a new value called new rate. Let's click on simulate and we'll see that the platform moves up and down. Now with some easing because we changed the curve, but the speed in which it reaches its target is still the same, one second. So let's go ahead and stop. What happens if we change our rate to two and click on simulate? Now it's twice as fast, right? 
and because our timeline is one second, the play rate basically acts as a factor. One would be 100%, two would be 200%, etc. So now our timeline is playing twice as fast, so our platform will reach its destination in half the time. So let's go ahead and stop and do the opposite. If we wanted our rate to be 0.5, what we're basically saying is that now the platform will reach its destination in half the time, or in other words, in two seconds. Let's go ahead and stop. So you can start seeing how we can add more and more controls to our blueprints for further customization. The last thing I'm going to add is a stop. What if we wanted to add a delay between calling these functions here? In other words, we wanted our platform to reach its destination, wait a specific amount of time before going back. Well, we've used the delay node before, so why don't we do that? Before we call our, our uh, events here, we can simply add a delay node in between. And now we can even create a variable that will set the duration of the delay. And in this case, let's name this stop duration. And we can connect the same variable to both delays, like so. And let's make our variable instance editable and go ahead and compile. And if we go back to our map, we see that now we're going to have a stop delay of 0.2 seconds. Let's make this two seconds. And now if we click on simulate, we see that our platform reaches its destination, waits for two seconds and goes back. And yet again, it waits two seconds and goes back. Let's go ahead and stop. And let's do one last thing, which is what if we added a delay before we call our function here, our custom event rather, go forward and do the exact same thing here. So let's go ahead and add a delay. But in this case, we want this duration to be a separate variable than stop duration. And in this case, let's call this start delay. Make this instance editable, compile, and let's make this one second, compile, and let's go back to our map. And now you see that we're going to wait for one second when we hit simulate. And then the platform will start moving back and forth. The interesting thing is that because these variables are public, for every single platform you put on your level, you can now customize it by changing its end location, the rate, the time it stops between going back and forth, and its starting delay. So we can simply duplicate this blueprint, hit Alt and drag. And for this one, we'll change our end location. Let's make this a little bit higher here. And let's change the rate to two and our stop delay or stop duration rather to one. And if we click simulate, you can clearly see that very, very quickly, we have added two different platforms that behave differently to our game by using the exact same code. As you're working through these examples, keep thinking about ways of making your code more modular and flexible. And one of those key ways is by making values from hard coded to variables and then making those variables public. Let's go ahead and stop and go back to our blueprint. So let's do a quick recap. We learned about the interp to nodes and how they take a current value and a target value. We learned that the current value usually changes as you interpolate. These nodes need to be continuously called to be effective. And you have two different versions the interp2 and the interp2 constant nodes. We also learned about the lerp nodes and how they take two static values. These nodes use an alpha, which is a scale between zero to one. And that alpha needs to be manually changed 
to be able to interpolate. And finally, we looked at the timeline node, which is a separate interpolation component. It uses one or more curve tracks. It is very customizable. It has built-in functionality to play forwards and in reverse. And you have the ability to adjust its play rate. If you want to practice what we learned, in the Timeline node, modify the Alpha Curve track by adding additional points. Also, add additional customization to your platform blueprint by adding more variables. And that's all for this lesson. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.